Hello and welcome to Hopewell's holiday video series funded by Bell Let's Talk. We hope you enjoyed today's video. So welcome everyone. So this evening we'll be talking about self-compassion and also comforting and soothing ourselves to alleviate self-criticism and shame, which can often emerge where self-compassion can really be influential in helping to alleviate those things. So this evening, what I'd like to do with all of you is to define what is compassion and self-compassion. So to look at those, that way we have an understanding of what they are, and also to examine some of the key components, as well as the relevance of self-compassion, the importance of it, and also explore the opposite of self-compassion, which is often self-criticism. And we'll also look at ways that we can use strategies to start to challenge some of that if we experience self-criticism or negative thoughts that emerge. And also finally, we'll look at how do we practice self-compassion? So it's one thing to look at the definition of what is self-compassion, but it's another thing to look at how do we implement that in our lives? How can we practice that and integrate those strategies? So I'll also share some of that information with you this evening as well. And if there are any questions at the end, please don't hesitate to jot them down or if something emerges, then feel free and I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. So when we look at self-compassion, to define self-compassion, we really need to start with what is compassion? The two are really one and of the same. And compassion is an attitude that involves a certain set of feelings, thoughts, motives, desires, urges, and behaviors that can be directed towards any living thing. So that can be ourselves, another person. It could be a group of people, a society, animals, the environment, et cetera. Therefore, when we talk about self-compassion, we are specific specifying that this attitude is being directed internally towards ourselves. And Kristen Neff and Paul Jabert, they're really two of the leading figures in the area of building self-compassion to improve mental health and well-being. And Kristen Neff defines compassion as the recognition and clear seeing of suffering, feelings of kindness for people who are suffering, so that the desire to help to ameliorate suffering, it emerges, recognizing our shared human condition as flawed and fragile as it can be because we're human. And in a similar manner, Paul Jobert defines compassion as a basic kindness with a deep awareness of the suffering of oneself and of other living things, coupled with the wish and effort to relieve it. So we can really see how compassion is oftentimes focused on the other, but there's also an element of empathy in there. When we can connect with another person, when we see that they're suffering, for example, if we see someone that's suffering, for example, grief, we might immediately think of our own lives where we've lost someone or something that meant a lot to us. So we can feel that sadness and suffering and we feel compassion towards the other person because we want to help ameliorate it their suffering and to provide them that support. So it really is a pro-social behavior wanting to help the other, including ourselves. And that's where self-compassion emerges. And self-compassion is simply giving the same kindness to ourselves that we would give to others. So how we would treat a close friend or perhaps a family member, treating ourselves in a similar manner and being kind to ourselves. And as we talk about later, this can certainly be challenging if we're struggling with self-criticism. And again, we're all human, so it emerges. So we'll look at some of those areas. And self-compassion, it can truly be a source of strength and resilience. It can really be a motivating factor when we have that kindness and love towards ourselves. And you'll notice oftentimes when I talk about self-compassion, I put my hand towards my heart. And I do that because that can be a strategy, especially if we're really struggling. It can be just to put our hand on our heart and to be that loving kindness towards oneself, ourselves. And it's interesting because some of the key components 
and those definitions that I shared with Neff and Gilbert, some of those key components of self-compassion are awareness. So being aware or sensitive to the fact that some sort of suffering is occurring. Now, suffering could mean some distressing struggle with emotional pain. It could be psychological pain, physical pain, or all of the above. It could also be spiritual suffering, spiritual pain. But we can see that it could be suffering in different forms, but it's having that awareness of it, the insight into it when we're experiencing it. And oftentimes that comes with different experiences. It takes time, but it's having that awareness so that when that emerges, that suffering, then we can delve into self-compassion, that inner kindness. And those definitions also touch on normalizing. So recognizing that experiencing this sort of pain, it is universal. We all experience pain at some point to varying degrees. The fact that we experience pain isn't a fault or feeling of ours. We are not to blame for our pain and we are not alone in our pain. So in many ways, it normalizes that because as humans, we do suffer. And as I said, it could be psychological, emotional, could be spiritual, physical, but we're not alone. We all do have different forms of suffering. They also point towards kindness. So not shying away from or ignoring the pain, but meeting this pain with feelings of kindness, care, warmth, and concern. So rather than striving for avoidance, in some ways it's honoring that pain that emerges in suffering in a way that is kind, compassionate, and it's caring towards oneself. And the definitions also touch on alleviation. So focusing our energy on ways to alleviate the pain, which may be via providing for the comfort and caring actions, providing a helpful perspective regarding whatever the trouble may be, whatever that issue may be, or having the strength and courage to take other necessary actions to address the problem being faced. So in many ways, it can help us alleviate that pain or suffering that we're experiencing. Once we, it normalizes it, we have the awareness and the kindness. And we'll talk more about that, how that can really alleviate the suffering, whatever form it may be and emerge for oneself. So the importance of self-compassion. So research has actually shown that self-compassion is strongly linked to our mental health and well-being. And studies have actually found that those who are more compassionate towards themselves tend to have less mental health issues, like for example, depression, anxiety, or stress. And these people also tend to have a better quality of life, a greater sense of well-being, and less issues in relationships. And compassion is linked to the hormone oxytocin, often called the love hormone. And this is a hormone that promotes bonding and closeness. And in this sense, it's particularly active at childbirth, during physical affection, when parents even play with their children or we play with our pets. And it's suggested that directing compassion inward can equally trigger, trigger that release of oxytocin and the calming benefits that it brings. So in essence, self-compassion goes hand in hand with general life contentment, something that we could all use a dose of at various times in our lives. And also balancing our emotions, that is also a very important aspect of self-compassion. And the reason why self-compassion might bring us such wonderful benefits is it plays a vital role in helping to balance our emotions. And Paul Joubert has written extensively about the idea that our emotions are governed by three systems known as the threat, drive, and soothe systems. So I'll touch on this with you as well, because each plays an important role in regulating our emotions. So threat, when he, Paul Gervais talks about that, what does he mean by that? Generally speaking, all living creatures are good at anticipating and avoiding threat in order to survive. This protective mechanism is hardwired within us all. And coupled with the human ability to think a lot, and we find that the human mind seems to have a default setting to look for, pay attention to, 
and repetitively think about, oftentimes it can be negative things. And this can result in our threat system being active in an overdrive a lot. So when activating the threat system, it can lead to emotional responses such as anxiety, anger, or depression. And these emotions are all about motivating us to protect ourselves with anger prompting us to confront and defeat danger, anxiety prompting us to shy away from danger, and depression, according to Gilbert, prompting us to shut down from danger. As such, the threat system also generates corresponding behavioral responses such as fight, so it can be aggression, it can be flight, avoidance, or it can be freeze, being submissive or passive. And oftentimes when we're in a threat mode, our thinking can become very narrow and negative. But it's important to know that the threat system is not a bad thing. Remember, its purpose is to keep us safe from legitimate threats. So for example, getting in the way of a moving vehicle. However, many of us and the mental health issues we experience can relate to the threat system being active too much of the time where there is no real danger. So that can create a lot of stress and resultant issues within one's cognitive thinking. So drive, when Gilbert talks about drive, it spurs us on to try new things, achieve things, set and work towards goals. I feel ecstatic, like those high five moments when we have those wins in life. And the drive system in many ways is what energizes us to get things done and to be active in life. And having that drive can be great because it keeps us progressing in life towards goals, motivations, inspiration. And without our drive system being active some of the time, we'd be rather directionless, a problem that can occur when one's feeling heavy anxiety or depression. And the only issue is that this system, like the threat system, can also kick into overdrive. And this particularly happens if we live in a society that is highly competitive, which unfortunately we do in some ways, the message that to do more is better. And so that can create a lot of stress. And what can happen is that when we don't succeed in our goals, which understandably is not always possible to do, then we can quickly flip from the drive system into the threat system. So we can see how they're all integrated. But lastly, and this one's really relevant for self-compassion, is the soothe system. And the soothe system is very different and has a calming influence on both the threat and drive systems, helping to quiet and silence them down when they're in that overactive method. And the soothe system is at work when we're just relaxing, or my little brother would cringe if I said this, but chilling out feeling safe, calm, and content. You can't be in threat and soothe mode at the same time. And you can't be in drive and soothe mode at the same time. So experiences of kindness and care tend to stimulate the soothe system. While receiving compassion for others is one way to unlock the soothe system, self-compassion is another key. And really, we're gonna talk about in the next while together in the slides, about how do we find this key and how can we use it whenever we need to calm the threat and drive systems or when we need that kindness towards oneself, ourselves, bringing the soothe system online to balance our emotions, be it happiness, contentment, sadness, anger, anxiety, whatever the emotion is, how can we activate that soothe system? And I do wanna to touch on because we talked about this earlier, we touched on this, the opposite of self-compassion and that is self-criticism. And for most individuals, being compassionate towards themselves and therefore activating the soothe system, it, sometimes it doesn't come naturally. However, the opposite of self-compassion, self-criticism seems to very easily roll off the tongue. And self-criticism is a thinking style that involves our internal self-talk being highly negative, disparaging, and berating towards oneself. And self-criticism can therefore activate the threat system in and of itself. Or once the threat system is active for various other reasons, responding by being critical 
of ourselves can keep the threat system alive. And the content of self thought, self critical thought, they can be very harsh and very cold and attacking towards oneself. It's, it is like we're telling off or reprimanding ourselves in a most unkind or punishing way. And this thinking style occurs within us all to varying degrees. And it's often very common in our society. And you'll notice that some self-critics refer to themselves in the first person, I am, while others may refer to themselves using a second person perspective, you are. And you will also notice that self-criticism often involves some of the following unhelpful thinking styles that can be labeling, so making global or derogatory statements about ourselves on the basis of behavior in a situation. So it could be, for example, I'm playing, I'm thinking when I was playing basketball with my younger brother, who's an excellent basketball player, and we were shooting hoops and I awkwardly miss. And a labeling would be, it didn't happen, but it could be, for example, I'm such a loser. I'm labeling myself based on that behavior experience, missing a basketball net. There could be the should statements, the shoulding. So using should statements to put unreasonable demands or pressure on ourselves. So it could be, you know, you, you miss something that's in your meal plan. Oh, I should know better. Oh, I should, I should do this. And the should statements can be very reprimanding instead of the kindness like, okay, next time I'll ensure that I include this in my meal plan or I'll make this adjustment. So you can see how the tone can really shift. And the thing about negative thoughts is they can emerge very quickly. It's not to say anything about us as individuals, but it just emerges very quickly. And oftentimes we're not even aware that it's a negative thinking style. And there can also be overgeneralizing. So taking one negative instance and concluding that this applies to everything. So catastrophizing it. So it could be, for example, I missed a component of my meal plan. And then I might say to myself, oh, I'm always gonna screw up, I can't get that right. And again, it might not be saying it vocally, but it could be internally within the mind. So again, this thinking style, it can occur to us all in varying degrees. And it is common in our society. And there are other negative thinking styles that emerge like the black and white thinking, all or nothing thinking. It could be jumping to quick conclusions and then forgetting that, okay, there's a bit in the gray area. What's in this gray area? It's not all or nothing. And so oftentimes we can fall into these thinking styles without even being aware because we are human and it happens. So how do we challenge self-criticism? So now we've highlighted some of those negative thinking styles that can emerge. And some of this can be writing it down. They're referred to in cognitive behavior therapy as thought records. So an easier way to do this, it can be either be on paper if you're a visual learner and you like to write things down, or it can be something that you do within your mind. But it could be evidence for the thought and evidence against the thought. So for example, what is the evidence for your beliefs? So if for example, in the basketball example, I'm like, I'm such a loser. I missed a hoop. Is the evidence for that belief, your beliefs, good, solid, or reliable? In that case, no, it was just one hoop. I made another one. Is there another way the evidence for your beliefs could be viewed? So you can start to challenge that a bit. It could be, oh, I was having a bad day. I was stressed, wasn't really focused. So that could be why I didn't do well. And so evidence against, so is there any evidence that goes against your beliefs? So for example, yes, I made a hoop, another one I did well. And what is the aim of your self-criticism? And does your self-criticism really achieve that goal? So self-criticism sometimes can emerge for perfectionistic reasons. We want things to go perfect, we wanna do our best, but does it actually help us achieve that goal? when we're being harsh towards oneself, ourselves? And can you achieve your goals without self-criticism? So instead by encouraging yourself or acting, doing something to achieve that goal, 
And is it self-criticism that is helpful or something else or taking action? So we can see that challenging that self-criticism, finding evidence for, but then also the evidence against that, whatever that negative thinking might be, finding evidence against that and holding on to that. Oftentimes this can include if you have self-criticism that emerges, something else that can be helpful is just a positive statement, so a mantra. So that could be, and you might already have one that you use, but it could be something like, I am good enough. I am enough. I am lovable. I've got this. And so take some time to think about that. If you find that you do experience self-criticism, what would be your go-to mantra? And it could be something that you jot down on paper and you carry it with you, or it could be something in your mind that you carry within your mind and heart. That way, during those difficult moments, you can draw on that. It could be, okay, I've got this. And just repeating that mantra to yourself when you're experiencing those self-critical, berating thoughts that emerge towards yourself. And again, it's no judgment. It happens. We're all human. But it can really help us to challenge that self-criticism because that's where self-compassion can come in. And the soothe system, it, it, it's elevated. So we can experience more kindness towards ourselves. that self-love. How we treat another person, we treat ourselves. How you might treat someone in your family, a dear friend or a child, you treat yourself, especially if self-criticism emerges. And this can be very helpful during recovery and remission from an eating disorder because oftentimes self-criticism emerges. It's like, oh, what am I doing? It can be really berating comments, body shaming comments. It could be a variety of comments. In my own experience, in my own history, it's been helpful to say, to do that breath. That's what has helped me touch the heart and say, okay, I've got this. I am enough. I've got this. And just gently repeating that to myself. And then those self-critical thoughts start to slow down. And the soothe system comes up, the kindness, the love and self-compassion. So how do we practice self-compassion? And as I touched on, it really begins with that self-kindness. So writing yourself something kind, understanding words of comfort, that you know that you care about yourself, adopting a gentle reassuring tone. And oftentimes that can include just something like a gratitude journal. It could be writing down three things that you're grateful for. You do it at the end of the night or in the morning when you wake up. And it could be that those three things that you're grateful for, they might be similar each evening and that's okay because that starts to elevate that self-kindness. It could be, I'm grateful for the great meal I had. I'm grateful for that I spent with my partner. I'm grateful for the fresh air that I got and got to walk my dog this evening. And it might repeat, but then you start to see that self-kindness because you are doing things that you enjoy and that you care about yourself. You're addressing your own needs. And practicing self-compassion also includes identifying your wants, needs, and goals. So every time you catch yourself being judgmental about your own wanted trait in the future, that negative self-thinking comes in, seek to reframe your inner dialogue. So seek to, to shift that so that's more encouraging and supportive. And remember that if you really want to motivate yourself, love is far more powerful than fear. Love is pa more powerful than fear. So being encouraging and supportive towards yourself that way, when those negative thinkings come up, like, oh, I'm such an idiot or whatever that may be, and it's different for all of us, but just remembering, okay, no, I am just frustrated. I've got this. I am enough. The mantra comes in. And again, once we start doing these behaviors, it becomes more instantaneous that we delve into that, the self-compassion versus the self-criticism because we become more familiarized with it. And so practicing components of self-compassion with those writing exercises can help you organize your thoughts and emotions while helping to encode them in your memory. So keeping them in your memory, it can really help encode and embed them in there. And even if you don't, if you prefer not to physically write down, you can even use your phone, like you could put a note, text yourself, you can do that, or even say it vocally. 
That way it's in your memory and encoded. And if you keep a journal regularly, your self-compassion practice will become even stronger and translate more easily into daily life. Because if you're regularly journaling, even if it's those three gratitude points, then it can become stronger. And the thing about gratitude is there's actually been research shown that when we look on things that we're grateful for, again, no matter how big or small we may think they are, that could be the judgmental part. But when we think about things we're grateful for, it could be relationships, events in our lives, animals, it can be a variety of things that increases positivity. And it actually increases that within our brain. And so that negativity, it dissipates. So the practice of gratitude and self-compassion can create more positivity in our lives, which can be really helpful during one's own journey, struggles, remission and recovery. It can be really beneficial for that, that positivity, the motivation and inspiration, because there are challenges that come up in life that we can't control that self-compassion and self-kindness love it truly is stronger than fear and it's interesting because we might have to ask ourselves you know why why might you know we experience that lack of self-compassion or self-criticism and interestingly it's about early life experiences so it's proposed that for some people, experiencing limited care, kindness, and nurturing from our others growing up, it can lead to the soothe system being underdeveloped. And the soothe system thrives on and is stimulated by having compassionate experiences. So in essence, it can be difficult. So if you didn't receive much compassion for others earlier on in life, or perhaps you did, but if you didn't, then it's understandable that it can be difficult to develop the ability to be compassionate towards yourself later in life. So having that awareness again, that even though this may be a new experience, this kindness and self-compassion, that we're all worth it. That self-love and the gratitude and the positivity. And as I said earlier, it can take different strategies and practice but once we do that, we engage in that, it becomes encoded in memory and becomes a new way of life, a way for us to live and cope and to treat ourselves and our connections with others. And so in brief, just to touch on what we talked about this evening is that self-compassion is really compassion directed towards ourselves internally. And self-compassion it involves being aware of our own pain and suffering and understanding that this is hard, but it's a normal part of the human experience. So it's being aware of that pain and suffering, be it emotional, psychological, physical, but recognizing this is normal and understanding that it is challenging, but that it is normal. Where it comes to the next part, directing feelings of kindness and care towards ourselves and focusing our attention and energy on how we might alleviate our pain and suffering. Those are really critical components of self-compassion. So directing all that kindness, care, and love towards ourselves during those challenging moments where that self-criticism can emerge, which is the opposite of self-compassion. And again, we are all human and we can all be self-critics, but it's being more aware of that. That way, when those thoughts emerge, that inner dialogue that we can use a mantra or the gratitude, some of those strategies we talked about earlier to be more loving and kind towards ourselves. So if my best friend told me this, would I say that to her or him? No, how would I reframe that? So it's putting that reframing in. And self-compassion, the beauty of that is it has many benefits for our own mental health as well as our well-being. And as I said earlier, the opposite of self-compassion is that self-criticism, that very negative thinking style that's often linked to difficult emotions and mental health issues. So that's where the beauty of self-compassion comes in is it can soothe ourselves and alleviate that suffering and shame that can emerge. Because sometimes shame does emerge. We feel 
ashamed of maybe certain thinking styles that we have, emotions and resultant behaviors. But that self-compassion is that loving, kind tone towards ourselves. It helps alleviate that because we're all human. We make mistakes. We aren't perfect. But we have that love, which is more powerful than fear, the love towards oneself, that true compassion. And with that, it can help alleviate some of the mental health issues that emerge. It can help us balance our emotions. And when our emotions are more balanced, it can help balance our thinking, which can result in our behaviors and actions. So our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, it can balance all of that in our soothe system. So that loving kindness towards oneself, helping us address our own needs. And it could be sometimes asserting ourselves, setting boundaries and relationships, but allowing us to get our needs met and also to set goals and being kind towards ourselves throughout that process. So if suffering does emerge, that way we have that self-compassion, love and kindness towards ourselves to help ameliorate it and alleviate it. 